Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories uh, podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's October 23rd, uh, 2017, and uh, we could not be more excited or thrilled or eager uh, to uh, have you join us for this very exciting interview with D. Michael Quinn, author of the book, uh, The Mormon Hierarchy, Wealth and, P and Corporate Power, uh, published by Signature Books. So we are uh, recording this in front of a, a live studio audience in Lehigh, Utah, and we're just very excited to have uh, uh, Dr. D. Michael Quinn back with us. This is not his first appearance on Mormon Stories. For those of you who don't uh, know about uh, Michael Quinn, uh, please go back and, and watch that interview. It's definitely one of the most powerful and important and fascinating interviews uh, we've, we've ever done on Mormon Stories podcast. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll make sure you guys know that, uh, a couple just quick announcements. Um, we are announcing, uh, the launching of a Mormon stories podcast being available through Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a really wonderful platform, uh, to make it possible for, uh, people to, uh, pay for or support these podcasts sort of on a per release basis. So you can sign up for $1 per, uh, interview or per release. And uh, let's just say we have six or eight uh, a month. It's just six or eight dollars a month. Just to be really clear about why we're doing that and what we're doing. Uh, we've got great supporters uh, for the Open Stories Foundation of people who support us at 10 or 25 or hundred dollars a month. Uh, that revenue is, is critical to the Open Stories Foundation because it's how we fund the Open Stories Foundation and our staff. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that only less than 1% of our listeners actually donate to Mormon Stories. So 99.5% of our listeners just listen for free and don't support us. Um, and so the reason why we've added Patreon to the mix is to incentivize those of you who, who feel like $10 or 15 or 20 or 100 bucks a month is too much. It's a way for you to just pay a lower amount. Um, and only to, to pay as we release things. So we definitely don't want any of you uh, who support us uh, through the normal channels to cancel and switch to Patreon. But we are trying to capture um, a little bit more higher percentage of our listeners because we really do need that support to keep uh, the operations of the Open Stories Foundation going. So I think the link is something like patreon.com slash Mormon Stories Podcast. You can go there, you can sign up. And as an incentive, what we're doing is we're going to be releasing these interviews two days early on Patreon uh, before the rest of everyone, the free listening audience, uh, gets to sign up. So if you want to get any of these interviews free or early going forward, not free, but early going forward, please uh, sign up to Patreon. And if you just want to be a normal uh, uh, Mormon Stories podcast listener, again, you can go to mormonstories.org and sign up there. Um, please check out our events page, mormonstories.org slash events for the upcoming events that we have to support uh, those who are struggling and need support in their faith transition. Uh, we get great feedback from those events and we'd love to support you with that as well as you need it. So those are all the announcements for this, uh, this interview um, before we begin. So without any further ado, uh, Michael Quinn, welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be back. Yeah, it's so great to have you. And um, I just have to say, it was a real treat to get this long-awaited book. We know that you've been working on it for quite a long time. Too long. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, well, um, uh, it was worth the wait. So, Thank you. So we're really excited to talk to you about it today. And we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about today. We do want to talk about the book. We want to talk about the research. We want to talk about responses to the book. Um, we're going to be taking live uh, questions from the audience, but then we're also going to do just an update on your life and how you're doing and also just uh, talk to you a bit about the state of the LDS Church today and all the new and exciting things that have been happening over the past few years uh, because we think your perspective and insight would be really valuable. So we're really excited. Thanks again for joining us. Glad to. All right, so um, let's begin with a little bit of the history about the making of this book. Do you mind telling us sort of when you first thought about writing this book and um, maybe sort of what the timeline was in actually getting it written? Well, it started before some of you here were born. Uh, <laughs> it started with a 
a course I took as a, a new graduate student at the University of Utah, and it was um, about historical methods, and it was taught by uh, Davis Bitton, and it was a two-term course, and the first term uh, was involved in readings and discussions, and the second term was primarily research to present toward the end of the term a paper of 30 to 50 pages based on one of the uh, methods that we learned about and read about uh, during the first term. Uh, and it was a, an exploration of, of methodologies or, or uh, ways of approaching history that at the time were called the new history because these were uh, approaches that were not traditional in the uh, writing of history, whether it was in Europe or in the United States. And, but particularly in the United States, it, it was uh, called the new history. And so our, our topics and the examples of usually books within those topics were things like women's history, which had been uh, ignored during the previous centuries of, of history that looked primarily at males. Common people's history, which had also been ignored in previous centuries with the traditional emphasis on elites. And then a th demographic history, which was uh, a kind of a merger uh, of <coughs> social science work, particularly sociology, with historical analysis so that you would look at a population, it might be the population of a town, over time so that you got a historical overview of it, but you're looking at the characteristics of that entire population uh, on various things that you, as an, as an author and researcher, were interested in so that you presented an, an image of what that population was, and that was demography. Uh, and typically in demography, you don't identify people by name. Even though you looked at records that identified them by name, you're looking at the characteristics of an entire group. Another one of the uh, pro uh, things that interested me particularly, and that was the beginning of what is now the Mormon hierarchy series, was uh, what was called group biography. And uh, the readings that we had in group biography were one an English example and another one an Italian example. And the English example was written by Sir Louis Namier looking at uh, an a, a institutional elite, looking at the English parliament during a, a period of time that corresponded to the reign of George III. And things that he was looking at uh, uh, for the characteristics of this limited group, which un unlike demography, was focusing on a smaller group in greater detail, whereas uh, demography is usually a group of hundreds, thousands in, many, in some cases uh, over time. In this group, it was a group of a few hundred over time, and he looked at things like uh, social class and most of the parliament even in including the, um, the Commons, the House of Commons, uh, had connections with the nobility of Europe and, and nobility of, of England, education, uh, military experience, and marriage and intermarriage, the relationships of kinship and marriage that existed between them. And then the second book we looked at was, uh, and I forget now the name of the the author of this, but it was a book about the Renaissance uh, elite in Florence. And it was looking, and this was a group that was not defined institutionally, it was defined according to the power and their characteristics. So those who were wealthy, those who uh, were known to exert power during that time, uh, informally could be defined as a particular group, but were not defined by specific positions that they held, like the parliament. And, uh, and those two books fascinated me. And so when it came to the point of choosing a, a topic that I was going to, 
write this 30 to 50 page uh, paper on. I wanted to do group biography. And then I was thinking, well, what group can I, can I do this about? So I thought of the Utah legislature, and I thought, oh, that's boring. And so then I thought the, the U.S. Senate, and I thought, well, that's more diverse than the Utah legislature, but I, I just wasn't, I didn't have a lot of enthusiasm for that. And then it occurred to me as like a light bulb, oh, this is a group I've been reading about for years, the Mormon hierarchy. And that's how it came about. And so I, in the paper that I wrote for uh, Davis Bitten's class, I looked at, their place of, of birth, their origin of, of where they grew up, their religious affiliation, their educational background, and their family uh, to a degree. I didn't go into a lot of detail but because I, I was only writing a 30 to 50 page paper. Well, that paper for his class, 30 to 50 pages, grew into uh, what became my master's thesis at the University of Utah. And that was about 200 and some odd pages long. And then I was accepted at Yale University primarily through the intervention of Leonard Arrington, uh, who uh, contacted Yale after I was turned down in my application for a Yale and had a conversation with the uh, dean of admissions at Yale and that resulted in Yale extending me another uh, an offer uh, after having turned me down once. And so I went to Yale as a PhD student because of the intervention of Leonard Arrington, who was at that time the church historian and I had served as his research assistant and co-author on, on one article with him. And then he promoted me to, uh, or promoted my uh, submitting articles of my own to various magazines and periodicals. And so when I started at the uh, graduate program at Yale in the fall of 1973, my uh, advisor there felt that it would be foolish for me to choose a topic other than the one I had been working on intensely. And so he said, well, certainly you should continue what you began at the University of Utah and make that your dissertation. And so this expanded this group biography, or what L Lewis Namier called it, prosopography, which is an old uh, term, uh, was what I you began writing on for my dissertation. And I completed that uh, uh, 33 months later uh, with, and got my PhD with the dissertation about the the Mormon hierarchy, and I looked at them as an, an elite group. And then I, because I w was hired just a few months later to teach at BYU, I was uh, anyone, who here has been a teacher, either public school or college? Okay, not too many know, but when you are teaching brand, brand new courses for the first time, and I was teaching three new courses at the uh, at BYU f in history you are basically lucky if you're only two steps ahead of your students in reading because everything you're doing you're doing from scratch and uh, and so I was so um, preoccupied with preparing for e these Monday Wednesday Friday lectures and presentations that I wanted to make always useful to the students for the for them to you know the ta the tuition they were paying and for their commitment to being in the class that working on this this project was you know beyond the board so in 1977 i uh i got a, a grant from the uh, um, national endowment for the humanities for the entire summer and I spent that entire summer working on business connections and going through the files of uh, county clerk's offices in outside Utah, all the counties uh, outside Utah in southern uh, Idaho. And then I went to um, Montana and I went to Oregon and I 
did research in Hawaii, and then I went down to Texas and uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California looking for uh, references in the Articles of Incorporation to these men, uh, 124 of them, that were a part of my study of the first century of the Mormon hierarchy. And I had initially begun the financial research in 1975, a year before I uh, was hired at BYU. And that research, uh, I inv investigated the corporate files at the uh, uh, state archives from the filings of corporations for Salt Lake County. And I looked through every, and those, those were quite detailed. They included not only the initial filing of the corporation's articles, but also Salt Lake was unique, uh, not only in Utah with Weber County and Utah County in having preserved these uh, bonds of election for directors throughout the history of the companies before they became uh, dissolved or uh, ended by choice or by, uh, by uh, the state uh, saying that you haven't paid your fees and therefore you're dis dissolved. And all the other counties of Utah and virtually every county in the United States that I'm aware of destroyed all of these other records besides the Articles of, of uh, Incorporation. And so I went through these files for 13,000 companies, uh, which was their original filing and also the bonds for every election that they had annually. And I uh, did that during the period from 19, summer of 1975 to uh, early 1976. And uh, then I did not come back to it again until that summer of 1977. And then I got sidetracked from one thing after another when I came back to BYU in the uh, fall of 1977. I was re assigned as a university assignment to work on a biography of J. Reuben Clark, who had not been a part of my original study because he became a general authority after my cutoff period, which was 1932. And that took five years, and so I was working on nothing else but that project. And uh, and then uh, I, after that, I did going back to teaching again, I was again focused on teaching. And so basically from the mid seventies on, I would skip a decade before I would return to the, the business activity of the leadership. And so in the mid 1980s, 1983 and 84, I looked at it again for, and it was because I was invited to give a paper about the general authorities at the Mormon History Association. And so I looked at all of the corporation records as of who was involved in the living current leadership in business at that time. And then I got preoccupied with other things and did not return to the uh, research on the Mormon hierarchy until the 90s. And so I then after I published the first two volumes of the Mormon History Association. Talk, talk about those really quick. Just g give our listeners, I didn't introduce the fact that this is actually part three in a three-part series. Most of our listeners will probably know that, but just in case they don't, uh, Signature Books has produced uh, two other volumes in this series uh, previously. Do you mind just, no, for I'd those who don't to. know, introducing those Briefly in well. 1994, uh, the first volume called Origins of Power came out, and that covered the period from Joseph Smith as a young man in the 1820s to the arrival of Brigham Young in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. And then in 1997, the second volume came out called Extensions of Power as a subtitle, and that uh, covered from 1848 until 1996, uh, which was the period at which I did my research and analysis and writing and then handed the manuscript to Signature Books to publish. And so 
those were the two time periods that were covered and went well beyond what I had originally uh, envisioned. I had originally thought I would only work on the Mormon hierarchy until 1932, but the assignment from BYU pushed it up to the 1960s, so I had a lot of research that I had done during a five-year period on uh, J. Reuben Clark as a member of the First Presidency and all the connections he had with general authorities that were far beyond, decades beyond my original cutoff point. And so when I started working on the Mormon hierarchy, uh, signature books encouraged me to bring it up to the time that I would publish, which was about a year before the publication date. Well, I had biographical sketches in both the first volume, covering primarily the Joseph Smith period, and the second volume coming, covering down to 1996. And the biographical sketches included different uh, emphasis, uh, different topics of each individual's life, and it was more, li uh, more like a sketch. It wasn't a biography. It was usually a page or two pages, some, some cases three pages in the printed version. And one of those sections was business, and I would just and I just listed the business names that these men were invited in. And my goal was that I had had, I had put together uh, what I saw as an appendix that included all of these businesses and all of the years in which the general authorities that I had uh, the uh, biographical sketches on, in what respect they were involved in these businesses as president, as director as incorporator, whatever. Well, it was a very long uh, appendix. And, and at, at the end, when I did the second volume, the second volume was, uh, well, when, I, when, when they first set it up, uh, at the time, the production editor was Connie Disney. And she came to me after I'd given them this, everything that I had written without except the business appendix and she said Mike it comes out ten a thousand pages in print <laughs> and she said we 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 can't publish a book that long and you have another appendix you want to add to it that's impossible we can't publish this this business appendix that you want and the only way we're going to be able to publish the what you've given us already is if we narrow the margins and make the type smaller and the spaces in between lines smaller and and doing her magic as production editor she brought that thousand page manuscript down to about 750 pages and and then they printed it on thinner paper and and got it to uh, be a, so that it wouldn't be a a, uh, a bindery breaker of the binding for the book and so here I had this this very large appendix and I couldn't publish it and then after I had done the work on that I got involved in a book some of you may know called Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview and that diverted my attention and then uh, after I published the uh, the 1997 second volume of the Mormon Hierarchy series I had decided I wanted to update and change the format of the Magic World book. And so I, I worked on that and got that uh, ready to print as a twice the size of the original second edition of the Early Mormonism and the Magic World View, and that came out in 1998. And so in the period from 1994 to 1998. Oh, and there was a book I'd also published for the, uh, the University of Illinois Press on same-sex relations among 19th century Americans. So in that space of four years, I had published four big books, and I was exhausted. And I actually, I felt like just leaving the field. I just felt like I've, I've, I'm at the bottom of the barrel. I can't do anything more. And so I had been given this offer to, um, to move to Mexico by a man who owned a hacienda in southern Mexico. And finally, I was at the point where I just didn't want to do anything else. 
historically, and that had been my excuse for not taking his invitation. And so I said, if the option is still open, I, 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 I'm going to take a break. I just can't work on Mormon history anymore. <clears throat> and so I went down to Mexico in, in Chiapas, which is, uh, my family is Mexican. Half of my ancestry is Mexican. But it's from Sinaloa, which is right now, you may know, uh, cartel headquarters, you know, the drug cartels in Mexico. And there is a long, uh, decades long uh, resort there in Mazatlan, uh, which is cordoned off from what goes on in the rest of, of Sinaloa. But my family was from Sinaloa, and when I moved to, uh, to Chiapas, Chiapas is 85% Maya, and uh, only 15 or so percent mixed what they call um, Ladinos, uh, which is a derogatory term. Um, it would be like using the N-word for African Americans. Uh, the, the people in Chiapas have no love for the rest of Mexico. And this is one of the things about Mexico, that each state in Mexico is almost like a different country. And they have different food, they have different traditions, and there are rivalries between them, even though they're all under one country. Well, anyway, that's where I lived. And during that period, I, I in fact, Will Bagley did an interview the night before I took the, the airplane to uh, Mexico City. And... It, in that, I just told him, I'm, I'm leaving Mormonism. I'm leaving Mormon history. And by that time, I'd been excommunicated in Mormonism, and, and it was an academic interest of mine, but I was just done. I was just exhausted. And so I went down to Mexico and uh, lived down there for about six months and uh, picked up street Spanish through a tutorial and and we're able to con converse with people on the street and and restaurant Spanish, but I I didn't ever become fluent in it. And when when I came back from from that experience, I was more interested in in the research I had been doing on same sex relations than I was in what I had done on Mormonism, and so I. Uh, I was encouraged to apply for a position at the uh, Utah, pardon me, not Utah, <laughs> the University of Southern California, and I was given a two-year uh, visiting scholar uh, appointment there. And for that period of time, I uh, worked full-time in re researching same-sex issues at the uh, U. Uh, U uh, USU's archive of uh, gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender history. And, uh, and so for that two years, I was not working on Mormonism at all. I was working on, on same-sex issues and the, the lectures I gave at, at various courses at, uh, in classes at USC were all about uh, the historical perspectives that I had gained about GLBTI uh, issues, and, and I had done a lot of cross-cultural. So typically what I did is I not only talked about American history and the American experience of sexuality and gender uh, from the Puritan uh, rival to the current time, but I also did cross-country, or probably cross-cultural analysis, so that I was comparing Europe with the, what I knew in the American experience. I was including my research in African sexualities, my research in Asian sexualities, and, and Oceanic uh, sociologies primarily, or sexualities primarily Polynesian. And so I would give egg lectures to courses in anthropology and, sex, and sexuality that were being offered by professors on a regular basis at USC, but I would be giving guest lectures uh, on this uh, overview of, of cross-cultural perspectives historically on these issues. So Mormonism was just simply not on my radar uh, at this time. I was working on many other things. And then when uh, I went to the conclusion of that two-year period, 
beyond my expectations, I was given an invitation for a full ride uh, visiting scholarship. When I say full ride, they just threw money at me at Yale for a year. And it paid all of my housing. It paid uh, everything uh, with a handsome honorarium. I had all faculty privileges for a year at Yale, but it was only for a year. But that year at Yale, with all the advantages they were giving me, allowed me to, to pay off for the first time in my adult life all of my loans that I had entered into since I had started as a freshman at BYU when I was 18, that I'd been carrying these loans. And when I didn't have an income during the 90s when I was working on the hierarchy project, I was living off, off uh, credit card loans for my living expenses. And at one point they reached 60K. Uh, and during the 90s, they generally varied between 90K and, or pardon me, between 40K and 60K during the 90s. And my year at Yale allowed me to pay off all of them, allowed me to pay off everything going back to when I was a freshman at BYU that I still had uh, paying interest on. And so that was a wonderful gift to me. But Yale wasn't interested in what I knew about same-sex dynamics because Yale, for, uh, Yale, I was uh, this publishing expert on Mormonism. And so I was dragged back into Mormon history out of same-sex dynamics is issues by this, this, this um, year-long uh, appointment I had at BYU. And initially, I, I wanted to do a continuation of my same-sex dynamics kind of work. And they said, well, okay, if you insist, you can do that. I mean, we'll, then we'll, we'll pay you the same and support you in the same way. But they really wanted me to do Mormonism. And then I ended up switching more and more. And by, by the second semester I was there, I was doing a lot of Mormon polygamy research. And, uh, and so I thought, okay, well, then I'm back in the Mormon thing. And then I got another out of the blue opportunity that again pushed me away from doing anything on the hierarchy. A man died and I'd known him for a year and a half before he died and I was stunned to learn that he had made a bequest in his will for me to write a biography of him and gave me a five-figure amount in, in, uh, as a request to do this. And I, you know, this is not something I could turn down because I had nothing. Leaving Yale, I mean, it was leaving an opportunity that allowed me to get out of debt. And my option was to go into debt again because I had nothing to work on if I were to go back to Mormon studies, which I had been thinking I would is do. <clears throat> and so I, I took off another five years and did not, and I was not finished with this study until 2008. 2008 is when you finished writing the book for that gentleman. That gentleman, right. We, we probably talked about this in our first interview, but just to remind people, that there was this sense that uh, you were sort of being uh, intentionally excluded from opportunities to sit in chairs of Mormon studies. That, that basically these chairs, like at Claremont or at Virginia or at Utah State, are primarily funded either by the church or by wealthy believing church members. Right. I even I even remember talk about an Arizona state chair that that maybe you'd been considered for, but that but the donors basically did what they could to blackball you and keep you from ever being able to have a full time faculty position in Mormon studies. Is yeah. That well, the I was turned down when I was the only applicant for two two positions, and that was, this was in two thousand four. Well, I was working on this other biography, but I, I was, uh, you know, I, I had told the the uh, um, the trustee of the estate if I get one of these appointments that I, I'm applying for, I'll have to defer um, your your completion of this biography. I will work on it. I, I feel committed to do it, but uh, you know, if I'm hired, I'll be hired, and that'll be my first priority is teaching. 
at, and initially it was the University of Utah. And I was offered, uh, well, not offered, I, I applied, and I ended up being the, the only finalist for this position in Western American history. And so I, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I'm, you know, it's my alma mater for my master's, and, and I'll um, come and be hired, and you know, I'll end up teaching the last 10 years of my active uh, career life before typically they try to get you to uh, retire and become emeritus. And um, I didn't impress them. And the, the um, history department at the U of U had for decades been polarized between those who were pro-Mormon and those who were anti-Mormon. Even if they had been raised Mormon, they did not want Mormonism to be emphasized and those two who had been at loggerheads for decades and barely on speaking terms could agree on one thing. We don't want Michael Quinn because for the pro-Mormons, I was anti-Mormon and openly gay. For the anti-Mormons, I presented too much of a positive image of, of Mormonism <laughs> and they didn't want me there for that reason and also they didn't want somebody who was a Mormon specialist to be uh, their new hire. And so they turned me down, at, uh, uh, even though I was the only applicant that year for the position they wanted to fill for the following year. So after that happened, Arizona State University, out of the blue again, I keep getting these offers out of the blue that I had not stopped, uh, thought for. Uh, one of them came to a, a Claremont uh, event that I attended and one of those professors from the Religious Studies Department of the Arizona State University campus uh, said, well, we would like to have you uh, be a, a guest for our department for a year's <coughs> appointment. And would you be interested? No, oh, yes, I really would, because this is after I'd been slapped in the face and turned down at the U of U. And so I, I applied for that, and the, the uh, department unanimously, this, this woman who had initially made the uh, invitation to me told me that the department had unanimously voted for me to be a one-year appointment, and it was potentially renewable, but definitely one year, full-time on the faculty in, in their department. And the outgoing chair who was being replaced that 1990, or pardon me, 2004, signed on and approved my being hired. And then the incoming new appointed uh, chair of the department approved it. It went up to the college. The college dean approved it. It went up to the, uh, to the university. And typically, I was told that that was a rubber stamp, that it once the, it was, particularly when it was a uni, uh, uni, universal approval from the department uh, professors, the chair, and then from the the um, the dean of the college, it was it was all, almost always a rubber stamp. Well, in the meantime, one of the the major donors uh, to the Arizona State University had gotten wind uh, through the uh, grapevine that I was being considered for an appointment as a professor at Arizona State University. And he picked up the phone and called the provost, uh, who I'm not sure if, if the provost was the one who made the, the decision for the uh, university or if it went to the academic vice president. But the provost is the one, this, this man uh, who is a billionaire in Arizona, a, a Mormon, called and he said, I understand you're considering hiring uh, Michael Quinn as a professor, yes. Uh, he's gotten the full approval down the line. And then the um, billionaire said, well, I'll give you this choice. You can have Michael Quinn as a professor or you can have a donation of $100 million. <laughs> and he said, those are my terms. If you hired Michael Quinn, you will not get my donation of $100 million. And I didn't know I was worth that much. <laughs> yeah, that's a compliment. That's a big compliment. And so this, 
<laughs> provost who had no connection with Mormonism. He was Jewish, but he had to be concerned about the welfare of the entire university. <laughs> if this offer had been made to Harvard or Yale, the answer would have been the same. We will take your, your donation. <laughs> and, and so the university turned down the, uh, the multi-tiered recommendation that I be uh, uh, the volunteer, not the volunteer, the visiting scholar in the religious studies department for the, the following fall, uh, fall 2004 to spring 2005. And that just came as a shock to everyone. It outraged, and the I heard from more than one member of the department that they were just outraged that this had been uh, the decision that, contrary to every other experience that not only their department, that other departments had had, that the university had reversed a decision that had been unanimous up the line. So anyway, so that happened. Well. This billionaire didn't trust the university uh, that they would keep their promise verbally to him. And so he waited to see what would happen in the fall term. And I wasn't hired and I wasn't there. And so in December, he and his wife made the million, or the 10 million, or $100 million donation. But he waited because <laughs> he didn't trust them. And uh, so again, uh, another lost cause. But anyway, in 2008, I finally was ready to go back intensively to the research on the hierarchy. And in the meantime, while I was working on this biography of this man that had come to me through his will, I contacted uh, Signature Books. And the managing director at that time was was Ron Prittis, and I told him, you know, I wanted them to publish this appendix as a standalone, and I said, I'll, I'll write a 10-page, maybe five or 10-page introduction to it, because the people who've read the first two volumes have the names of the companies, but they don't have the, the histories of the companies that this appendix will give. And he said, Mike, we want, we're not going to publish an appendix. Uh, you know, that, that would be uh, contrary to our, our mission. And he said, you've got to publish an actual, write an actual book. And if you submit an actual book that covers a, uh, a big swath of material, then we'll consider it and probably publish it. But there's no way we're going to publish an appendix. And I was so tired of this. I was just beyond myself. And I said, well, I don't want to do, go back to this research that I started in the mid-70s. And, uh, and I'm not going to. And he said, well, then you're not going to get it published. And, and so I whined and moaned and groaned and had more than one conversation with him. And he, just, he was adamant that, that they wanted a complete book and not just this appendix of one damn fact after another about all you know these, these companies. And at the time, uh, when I published the, the um, uh, ex Extensions of Power in 1997, I listed that there were about 900 companies that the hierarchy were involved in from the 1830s to the uh, 1930s. And so, Contrary to my wishes, and because of these conversations with Ron, I finally gave in, and in June of 2008, I started working full-time on not just that early period of the first century of Mormonism, but I thought, damn, I'll bring it right up to the 20th century. I mean, he wants a full a full story, a full, fully developed book, and you know, if I'm publishing it in the 21st century, I'll, I'll bite the bullet and I'll bring it up to the 21st century. And so I decided that I was going to cover up to the 2010 period because I knew it would take me several years of research. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll look for everything I can up to 2010. And so I worked on it from full time from June 2008 until 2012, that four-year period. And then I gave them a manuscript in 2012. And 
by that time, they were happy to receive a full book that was really a book, but there was a big, big line of books ahead of them that they had already committed and put into line for publishing. And so it took these years to get it published, five years basically. And I'm glad, I mean glad for two reasons. I'm glad that Ron forced me to publish a complete book because now that appendix, which is appendix five in there, doesn't have 800 uh, companies listed between the 1830s and 1932. It has 1,600. I doubled the number of books because of the research that I was forced to do. And I went and I looked not only from, you know, 1930s re onward, I looked over the whole schmear because I thought if I'm going to do this research, I'm going to cover everything and find everything I can from 1830s to the present. And in the process, I doubled the number of companies that I had originally planned to publish as an appendix. And then I included stuff down to the present. So why was this appendix, this list of companies of corporations, why do you think that's so important? Well, it, it, it was important because the, the mere list of names that I'd provided with each of the men as far as I'd researched them into the 90s, uh, allowed misinterpretations by readers. It allowed readers to think, oh, they were involved in these throughout their whole lives, or maybe they were involved for them for one year, and it was a total mixture. And so that would, was essentially uninformative. All it told the readers of the first two volumes was that Brigham Young or that J, uh, not J. Reuben Clark, Heber J. Grant in the second volumes of uh, biographical sketches was involved in these many named companies. But there was no indication of how they were involved, president, uh, vice president, uh, or a director without being an officer, and during what time period. So there was no flesh. All that was there were the bare bones titles. And it was really uninformative beyond that for the readers. And I felt they deserved to have a, a, a full picture of that business uh, so that they would not overestimate what the involvement was nor underestimate it. And that's why it had always been so important to me to get that published. But as required by Ron Prittis to do a complete study, I went back and redid that as well as everything from 1933 to the 21st century, and I found a lot of wonderful new material which expanded that, that initial 100-year time period of business histories almost double to what I originally prepared. And so it, it fleshed out the involvement of that original group of 124 men far more than I had anticipated and far more than I understood. So, you know, it's always good to be forced to do more research than you <laughs> want to do. And then, and then I found out a lot about the, the 21st century uh, activity of the church in not only uh, regional corporations, but national corporations and international corporations something that I had no knowledge of when I was doing the first two volumes. I had, had not looked at the international finances and business at all. So it was a tremendous amount of reassessment for me of what I'd already researched and finding new material about that, but also uh, like a kid in a candy store discovering wonderful things that I just hadn't stumbled across before because I hadn't looked for them. And so that, you know, was a, a journey as a researcher and a writer that I just was not willing to do until I was basically forced, forced to do it. <laughs> and, and then once I was forced to do it, I was so happy Good. that that was what Ron Pritt has said required of me. So to give our listeners a sense for the primary categories of sources for the book, I think a lot of us envision you when you worked for Leonard Arrington, like photocopying or mimeographing as much as you could in terms of whatever access you had to church archives during that time. So I imagine that that might be one of the sources for for this book. 
talk about the main buckets of sources that, that, okay. that make up this book. Uh, you're right to a, a, a small degree about the photocopying. Um, I, as a, an employee of the Church Historical Department from 1972 to, I, uh, from March 1972 until August 1973, when I went to Yale, I, I had the right to, as an employee, to of two cents a page per photocopying. And that sounds like really a small amount of money, but my wife and I were just coming, had just come out of the army when uh, I started doing this, this research in the church archives initially as a graduate student. We were basically living hand to mouth. And two cents a page with all the thousands of pages of great stuff I was reading would add, have added up to a huge deduction from what we had to live on. And so I, uh, I don't think I photocopied during that year and a half more than 50 pages. And those 50 pages were all tithing records of the general authorities, tithing they paid. And also the, uh, the annual reports of the presiding bishopric because I didn't want to depend on, on typing and making an error in typing those or hand, you know, handwriting. And so those I photocopied, and those were basically the only things I photocopied. Everything else I typed. I'd been, uh, I was uh, uh, tested in the military while I was a counterintelligence agent at uh, uh, my typing minus errors, and I was 100 words a minute typing after you deduct errors. So I typed fast. And at, at BYU, as an uh, undergraduate, I had been timed in reading, and I, I read 1,500 words a minute. So I, I read fast, and I typed fast, and so during those 15, or, well, 18 months that I was uh, Leonard Arrington's, uh, not only his only research, I was in a, a staff of researchers, um, I was allowed access to anything I wanted. And so I took research on, and notes, 100 words a minute or, or so, and 1,500 words writing, reading. Um, and I would type on a particular source, page one to page however. Uh, and with the diaries of, of Heber J. Grant, I took about 300 pages of notes, uh, type single space. And then on other things, I might only take one page of notes that I found interesting. But I did that for that whole period of time. And so rather than photocopying, I, that was what I, I took in the notes. And then after I went to BYU, I continued that on Tuesday, Thursdays. I spent full days uh, in the archives doing research until I was denied further opportunity to do research in, in on 1986, and it was because uh, they had a, a form, a document, that all researchers had to sign where they gave the right of review and censorship to a committee of the church of anything they had researched, the, the researcher had researched at any time in the past. And I said, I'm not going to sign an ex post facto document. And when I originally signed it, I said anything, and I scratched out at any time, and I put in researched after the date that I signed it. And I said, I, you know, I'll, I'll live with that. And they said, well, no, we want, we want it to cover everything you've ever researched. And I said, fooey, I'm not going to do that. And they said, well, then you're not going to do any more research here. And I understood that there were some others who refused to sign the form and therefore from 1986 until about 1982 so for about a six-year period they had that 92 i think it was 92 okay. i i i wasn't doing research and so only go by what people had told me but i think it was 91 or 92 when they had so much criticism about this requirement that they created a new um a document that researchers signed and it had no provision for that and it simply said uh, anything you publish uh, is governed by federal law uh, fair use 
And, you know, that's fine. No one objects to that because everyone is governed by fair use requirements of, of federal copyright law. And so uh, from that point forward, uh, I could have, but I didn't for another five years go back to the church archives until I was do working on the, the um, revision of the Magic World book in 1997. And there, uh, by going through their index, which was available without signing the form, I had realized that there were things I needed to research to do that update. Uh, healing ordinances and other things that I knew pertained to it. And so I thought, well, you know, what can they do? Kill me and eat me if I apply and they turn me down. So I, I applied for the, the research permission again. And I had not had it there since 1986, had not been there doing research until 1997. And I submitted the application and I was granted it that day. Post excommunication. Yeah, post excommunication. Five years, well, four years after I was excommunicated. And, uh, and three years after Origins of Power came out. And I had not done research at the church archives since 1986. Any way to estimate how many of those pages you generated through reading? Tens of thousands of Tens pages. Of th how many boxes? Would you uh, well, I, it's hard for me to uh, estimate. I think I, I, think I put 20, 20 boxes uh, and sent them to Yale. Of, of those, but so it Yale's could, have, got been, your, could Yale, have been more. Yale's got uh, your paper collection? Yeah, Yale has my collection at the Beinecke Library, and it's open for research. That's totally open to any researcher, all those notes. And then in the meantime, over the years, other researchers gave me their photocopies of material. And so if you do research in my research search files at, at Yale, you'll find a lot of photocopied material, but it's material that other people gave me. And essentially, all I photocopied there were the financial records of tithing paid by general authorities and of the presiding bishopric's annual reports that showed tithing and that kind of thing. Uh, and everything else was in uh, a gift to me that's photocopied uh, from var various sources. And then uh, the balance of it is my 100 okay. page, under word a minute. Type, type scripts, and some of them were verbatim, complete type scripts of documents, but most of them were excerpts that I found interesting, and I had wide-ranging interest because from the time I started research, before I was uh, hired by Leonard, when he was just a researcher there in uh, the summer of 1971, I was interested in everything, and so I would take down notes of everything I thought I might conceivably use one day to uh, create a, my own article, of whether it was Adam God or polygamy or theocrat the theocracy or whatever it might be, decision-making of the leaders, uh, relations with their wives, uh, anything that I found I took in notes on. And then in the, in the, or in the um, our margin, I would write what topic it had to, uh, my notes had <coughs> pertained to. And for many years, I depended on memory to go through my thousands and then ten thousands of pages of notes that somewhere in the Wolfwood Woodruff uh, notes I've taken on a page on the right hand side and the upper part of that page is something about Adam God. And I would depend on my memory for that. And I would read through the all my notes. And that's how I kept all of this in my mind because I was reading and reading. Every time I wrote something, I would read through the all <coughs> thousands of pages of notes to look for the things that pertain to my article on the prayer circle or my article on the Council of 50 or wherever because I, I didn't know exactly where they were. And so by the process of constantly, every time I published a new article, reading through everything that I had all previously researched in my notes up to the point of preparing that article, I, I got the stuff stuck in my head. Nice. And, uh, and luckily, it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other main categories of sources for this book besides those? Uh, yeah, BYU. 
It's uh, had uh, the the thing about manuscripts is that unless the manuscripts are photocopied or microfilmed, they're unique to whoever holds them. And so a manuscript library, whether it's BYU, the manuscripts they have are unique, and you generally have to go there to donate them unless the donor has donated multiple copies. And in some cases, that's the case. But in other cases, you go and, and you have a unique opportunity to research a source that is only at that archive. So the archives of the uh, Utah <coughs> State, I looked at the archives of uh, Logan, USU, of Weber State University, of the University of Utah, of BYU, of uh, um, in Utah, then then I would did research at Yale. They have a very significant connect collection. At the Huntington Library, they have a very significant collection. At the Bancroft Library at, at the University of California in Berkeley, I researched that. And in many cases, I went back when I started in 2008. I went back to all of these archives if I thought they had something or if I knew by looking at their online catalogs they had something that I needed for this expanded book on church business and, and, uh, and companies. And so uh, I also, the Library of Congress, I had researched back in the 70s when I was given stack privileges to go wander through all the stacks of all their business um, uh, trade publications and their annual reports of, uh, of uh, industries like lumber or mining. They all had publications that came out annually. And I went through every one of those in the Library of Congress for these men during that first century. And so I didn't want to go back and to look for anything that detailed. Uh, for the 1980s. In the 1980s, I depended primarily on the Utah Corporation Division. And then in the 1990s and, uh, and the 2000s, I again limited it to the archives that were available to me in Utah. And so uh, to the degree that there may be material in the 1990s or pertaining to the 1990s, and the 2000s uh, elsewhere, uh, it's, a, it's thinner research. However, almost all of the stuff that I was interested in is online now, even current financial reports. And because I had waited to do this expanded version until the 21st century, uh, corporation divisions of every state and most counties have the records I was interested in including 21st century records online. And if, if they weren't totally available, they, they had the, the corporate number and you could write and ask for a PDF. And so I was able to get PDFs of a lot of this material that I would otherwise back in the old days had to have seen in person and now is available sometimes for a fee, just, sometimes just gratis if you tell them specifically the name you're interested in of the company and use their indexing uh, online to find the, the corporation number because basically they're stuck by that. They, they don't look up by name generally. They use the name to find the number and then they look at the number and give you a PDF. So for the 21st century, I, I had those opportunities. And then, and again, these are just things that sometimes fell into my lap. I had no idea that the church internationally had to file reports to these every country in every language that the church is, is, is in. And in a conversation with somebody when I was talking about this, I, I just mentioned, you know, that I'm now looking at the leadership and the activities of the church in the 20th century and reading online reports uh, that are available in newspapers uh, about the church's uh, investment in one corporation or another and was said well have you looked at Canada's annual reports and I said what reports I had no idea and it, so it was through these these chance uh, considerate recommendations of a couple of people that I realized that there were these reports and early on 
once I, I looked at the UK reports and the Canada reports, I decided these must be given by every report in every language that where the church is, is located, Latin America and Asia and Africa and, and continental Europe. But I don't want to get into these reports and have to translate them from their languages and then be accused of mistranslating or misunderstanding the accounting terms and the, the terms that would be uh, used for all of these reports. And so I decided, all right, I'm going to limit it to English language reports where I can't be making those kinds of mistakes or have people think I've made those kinds of mistakes. And so I contacted by going online, again, which I hadn't realized until I'd received these these recommendations that I could, that there were these reports that were submitted annually in the 20th century and had even earlier than that, but that were available. And I was decided I would limit my research to the 21st century. So I contacted all of these countries for their English language reports, including Hong Kong, which although it's a, a special regional administrative district of the PRC, in the PRC generally, the reports are in Chinese or Mandarin. In Hong Kong, because of its uh, new, uh, specific English background, they, they submit them to the People's Republic of China in Mandarin, but they uh, or well, I'm pretty sure they, they do it in Mandarin, not uh, Cantonese. But they also make it in English because so many of the Hong Kong residents have English background. I wrote to them, and like some other countries I had, I was unsuccessful in getting their financial reports. I got what they called a financial report and paid for it, and they sent it to me by mail. It had nothing financial in detail like the UK reports and the Canada reports did, and the Australian reports. So that was, I mean, I may have asked the wrong kind of question, but what I had, what I got from them said financial report, but it had no, none of the details. And I contacted uh, African countries, sub-Sahara African countries, um, like Nigeria and Ghana, where there are very significant, uh, the two of those combined have more than a million Mormons on the records. And, and both of them said, oh yeah, we'll be glad to give you those reports. And so they gave me the name, but you need to get them from this person. So I contacted this person. Yes, but you need to get, and, the per and they, and they sent me back to the person I'd already contacted. And so I'd say, this person has already said to me, after you recommended me to contact him or her for getting copies of these reports, and then I'd say, I'd be glad to pay for any, you know, whatever amount you ask. And they said, no. We were correct. It was this person, and I was bounced back and forth, wow. and I got a runaround in both Ghana and Nigeria, and I could never get their English language reports. <laughs> so I just noted that in uh, as a, and I cited the the correspondence, usually email correspondence. South Africa had their one report online, and I contacted them, and they said that's all they had, and it was an incomplete report. And so even though they had English language reports, they said. That, you know that that was the only one that provided details and so it ended up being six countries that I depended on and I got every p report I could in the 20th century from New Zealand Australia Tonga the Philippines Canada and the UK and some of those reports began as early as the year 2000 and others didn't begin until about 2004 or 5 and then all of them were current up to the year 2010. And this book includes the 2010 reports from all six countries, but um, I, I instead included statistical analyses of the, the main, what I thought would be the main uh, items of interest to a reader each year, pardon me, each year for these f six different countries during the 21st century where those reports were available to me. And again, they vary for each country, but then I put tables in the chapter three for each of those countries and, and then analyzed in the text 
the trends. So those annual reports are nowhere in the book. You have tables in the book where I provide uh, numerical values derived directly from those reports and then I analyze them in percentages and then I analyze them in the chapter with trends that I observed right. with re regard to those companies. So those are the sources that I used as well as online newspapers. What about uh, Mormon Leaks? What role did Mormon Leaks play as a source? Only in one sense and I have mixed feelings. I think I'm not sure if all historians have mixed feelings about using something like WikiLeaks, or in, in which is uh, the forerunner of Mormon, and if I think it was originally called Mormon Wiki, and then it became WikiLeaks, uh, Mormon version. Um, many of these documents are, are stolen documents, uh, or obtained through deception as, as the WikiLeaks documents are. And as important as they are as sources, historians typically are, you know, have to balance their ethical issues about using stolen information with the importance of this stolen information that the historians didn't st steal. And it is available in, in our wonderful internet age to them with a <coughs> click of a, of a, a mouse and, all right, do I ignore this crucial information about a subject I'm writing a book on or an article on? Or do I bend my ethics about, you know, not, I would never steal anything from an archive, but this important information was stolen and is now available uh, to me as, a, as an internet user. And, and so I think every historian struggles with that, at least initially, um, and I did. And so what I, I used uh, originated with Wik WikiLeaks, Mormon Leaks, um, was uh, I made the decision, if it's been published in the newspaper, then I can blame someone else for it. And I won't have any, I've never had any problem citing any newspaper. And I've used communist newspapers and, and uh, anarchist newspapers. I, I used a number of those in Nazi newspapers when I was writing my biography of, of uh, J. Reuben Clark because those were things that affected his, his, the information that he was receiving. And, and his library included communist publications and Nazi publications for one reason or another, which I won't get into here. <laughs> but um, I, my, I, I have no, no conscience issue or ethical problem issue using something that has been published in a print format. And this is old style. I'm old school in this regard. And I think historians trained in the since the 1990s, since the internet, um, late 1990s, definitely. I don't think have any of those qualms that I, that I have, because I'm old school. But anyway, because uh, Peggy Fletcher Stack did a uh, detailed article using the documents that originally were released on, on Mormon leaks, then I cited her article. And I am so glad that Signature Books could not publish my, my third volume until this year because her article came out in December 2017 that showed these, these or was it 2016? I thought it was 17. It was December 2016. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, because it came out so late, I was able to use these pay stubs and this, this uh, photocopy of a letter uh, uh, to a general authority about incomes in the late 1990s, 1999 per, uh, exactly, and 2014. And those were crucial uh, for the analysis that I was doing in the book. And so I'm so glad that I uh, did not rush into print with signature as I wanted to. To, uh, when I handed them the manuscript in 2010 because I would have been absent that crucial information. So, um, it, you know, there were multiple reasons that uh, I was mistaken and, 
and uh, Ron Prittis was right in, in asking for something expanded, and I was a great beneficiary of the, re of the frustration you all and I went through with announcements of the upcoming publication of a book that kept not being published, and the, the release date keep, keep, was being pushed forward from 2012 to 2013 to 2014, and mine. finally, many of you didn't believe it was going to be 2017 when they announced it. But we all benefited from that because this book has those disclosures that, that were made by initially Mormon leaks and then uh, uh, Peggy Fletcher Stack in the Salt Lake Tribune. And I quoted her. And those are the only things that originated with uh, Mormon leaks. And I, and I don't use, many of you may know, I'm, I'm a semi-Luddite. I only use that amount of technology that I absolutely must use. And so I've only had a cell phone for a year and a half. I uh, didn't start using the internet until I was at Yale in 2002. And I am not online at home uh, in my condo. And so I do my emailing and I do uh, internet searches during the hour to two hours that public libraries allow me to use their computers for that. And so uh, typically I use up all my library hours just doing emailing. And so I don't have time to, to browse websites and, and blog the Mormon blogosphere. I, I just don't get involved in that right. at all. Yeah. At any point, have you received any indication, any communication from the church or any indication that the church was concerned about this book, your research or this book being published? No, and it was very open that I was doing this research. I, you know, I, I uh, didn't make any secret of it. And it's not generally. They have, there have been exceptions. There were exceptions for Von Brody's no Man Knows My History in 1945. And, and the other exception that I can think of was under the uh, banner of heaven that uh, it came out that the church made a, a formal statement, in, you know, an official statement about. But generally, that's not their style because they, they know the, the publishing maxim that, that banned in Boston means bookseller and book sale and, and uh, <laughs> bestseller. And so if, if something gets the no notoriety of being attacked or banned in Boston, and, and that was the old print version of, of leading into a bestseller, uh, the church generally has not made public comments. And that's been true of all of my books. Uh, they have not. However, the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, when it came out in 1992, cited many of my articles that have been published, primarily those in the uh, in BYU studies. But they, you know, they, I, even though I was under the ban even then, before my excommunication, uh, meant many of those brave-hearted uh, contributors uh, cited cited things that I had published, and many uh, of the uh, publications that have come from BYU's Religious Studies Center have cited my publications, including publications uh, came, that came out in Dialogue and Sunstone and, and, and Signature Books publications. So it, it's depended on the format and the venue, but public uh, statements, church headquarters has never made those about any of my publications. Any private concern expressed? No. Have the, they, did they, the, the, one, the only things that I heard were behind the scenes. And I heard typically, uh, like when the article on post-manifesto polygamy came out in 1985 in Dialogue, I, at that time, was uh, was still you know active in the church and participating and had both stake and, and ward positions and sons of members of the twelve not members of the twelve themselves but sons or daughters but usually sons reported back to me that 
uh, that what was said by Boyd K. Packard in the meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve about my article in Dialogue magazine. And, uh, and, I, and then I got feedback uh, about my prayer circle article that I had published a few years earlier in BYU Studies, which was a, quote, safe uh, format to, to publish something controversial in. I got back positive uh, feedback from, uh, from um, ha um, Gordon B. Hinckley directly when I was a visiting high councilman in, in a ward where he, his son was the bishop and I ended up sitting on the stand next to him, he asked me if I was the D. Michael Quinn who was a professor at BYU since I lived in Salt Lake and, and was a uh, high council, visiting high councilman in a Salt Lake stake and I said yes and he said, well you published an interesting article hmm. about the prayer circle. That's the only um, Apost uh, apostolic comment about a publication that I made. I got from from Gordon B. Hinckley. Uh, I have my mission president was a general authority, uh, Marion D. Hanks, and he commented on several occasions. But no, no concern expressed about this book before no, it got published. No, only things that I heard uh, from second or third hand sources. And in some cases, they were from students of mine when I was at BYU who relayed to me things that members of the 12, uh, or one particular member of the 12, had said to me, said to them about things I had written. And then in other cases, uh, I was being told by uh, administrators at BYU what uh, general authorities had told them about things I had published. But that was the extent of it. I received no, uh, no, no verbal comment except from Gordon B. Hinckley and, and Marin D. Hanks, and no second-hand comments um, except criticism. Uh, those usual were criticisms of what I'd published, but they were all, always second-hand. So you, you don't have a sense that anyone was concerned that this book was... And I right? never received any, any comment about the... No nervousness platform. or... Okay. No. Okay. If, if there were comments or concerns expressed about that, uh, I never heard them. Okay. And did you attempt to get support from the church, maybe asking for documentation for No, I, I did research. I didn't want to push boundaries that I knew were there and, and knew that were imposed by authorities higher than those that worked or served at uh, the church history library. So I, I, I did inquire for restrictions because some things were restricted <coughs> locally. When I say locally, they were restricted by the, the administrators or the people at the church history library. And so I did request uh, re items that were of a financial or business nature that on the, on the um, catalog in information it said restricted. And then I made formal requests to see those things and I was given a access to those, but it was an in-house thing within the church history uh, library because they had imposed the, uh, the re uh, restrictions themselves and in some cases and in fact many cases it was because they weren't processed and they didn't know what was exactly in there and they so they quickly read them and then said oh this is uh, not not uh, sensitive enough to keep restricted from Mike and so they allowed me to see those. There were other things that they wouldn't allow me to see because the restrictions were imposed at a higher level and they couldn't simply uh, give them to me as, as documents were, that were exceptions to the restrictions that had been imposed by a higher authority. So those, I, even though I asked for as sweetly as I had the, the things they did give me as exceptions, they just said, Mike, you know, we can't, we, we are not able to give anyone access to those documents. Okay, got it. But I, I never even, and there were things, you know, the Mormon rumor, rumor mill is extensive and runs deep, and, and I, I was oftentimes, you know, people would say they were 
you know, individually supportive of things I was doing and they thought my idea for third volume was good and whatever. But I never heard even from these informal discussions that there was any general authority input one way or the other. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I had an interesting experience reading this book and I'm curious if you've had other people give the same experience. So I'm thinking it's a thick book, you know, and, and it's going to take forever to read it. And so I start digging in and, you know, I'm getting about 100 pages in thinking this is going to take me forever, right? And then I realized that, that actual, the actual writing in the book, there's only 100, 120, 130 pages of actual writing um, and then a huge chunk is is the appendices, right? And then even within the pages that you did write, multiple pages of footnotes per per chapter, right? So I don't, I, you know, it is a lot less writing than I anticipated, right? What are but, your thoughts or responses to that? Did well, other people said that, and you know, count your blessings because it was <laughs> going to be five pages to begin with. <laughs> sure, sure. You just said you didn't want to write it, right? No, I did not. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it it just it just grew because I found things that were enough to write about. Sure. And I then I found things that I I found one very interesting source on, and I thought I've got to explore and and flesh this out. Sure. I, and and so. Uh, you know, beyond my, my, uh, and it wasn't better wisdom. It was beyond my entrenched opposition to doing, uh, more writing and more research. I did more writing and research. So, you know, if, if you're disappointed, you no, know, I didn't say I was disappointed. Well, I was no, surprised. Surprised. All right. If you're, you're surprised, uh, balance that surprise with the, the reality that, I wrote those chapters under duress, <laughs> and I, I, I treated them, once I realized what I was really writing about, particularly in the period beyond what I had originally researched, I treated them with loving attention because I realized I had discovered things and was writing about things that I had really previously not even known about. And that was exciting. And so I had a lot of kid in the candy store moments uh, in the process of preparing those books. But in large measure, though, those three chapters are derivative from those uh, appendixes. Uh, and it's 21 appendixes, and you know, it's one damn fact after another. But in uh, trying to understand how I could make those understandable to general readers without the jargon or with as little jargon as, as, as possible and try to make the statistics understandable for a general audience. Uh, I, I sweated bricks over those. And, and so those chapters represent, and those tables, which I tried so hard to make self-evident, uh, are, are the result of, of finding this voluminous amount of information and then trying to distill it into narrative that would flow and that would present an overview in depth, but also an overview of 180 years of business and finance. And, and so that's what I did. And it ended up being that I, I, I found that three chapters was all I needed. Uh, and, and people, well, I, after I submitted the, the book and business, uh, not Business Week, um, Bloomberg News, uh, made it w kind of worldwide, internet-wide known that I was working on a book about church finances that they had interviewed me about and learned about and they promoted and after people read that Bloomberg News uh, report and, and uh, learned that I was working on a book, people would come up to me and say, after I'd submitted the, the manuscript in the main to Signature Books, they would say, oh, have you read this thing? Or I, I know somebody who works at church headquarters, and I think they have documents that you may want to say, 
my answer was that can go in your book about the hierarchy and church in you know church income and finances and business i am done you know and and really the only major addition that i made was the thing that Peggy Fletcher stack. So I did. I did wonder if there were like church employees that wanted to secretly pass on, you know, documents to you, or other people who had sort of documents from various sources. Not church employees directly, but I have. Pe- I had people who said, "Oh, I have a friend who a friend who uh, has knows this church employee, and maybe if you ask, uh, you know, you can get this information." And I said, "Forget about it. I'm I'm over this." And uh, I am done with this. And, you know, you, if you want to write about it yeah. or you want to see it in print, that's great. But and don't, you, don't you didn't have people offering you sort of secret stashes of documents. They did. Yeah. And, and, I, was, and I was just saying, I'm done. Okay. Okay. And that's because they came after 2012 or mm-hmm. you, were, you were? I was okay. done. All right. and, and you'll find that even though I used the cutoff at 2012, I refer in passing to certain items that pertain all the way up to, to you know up to the present, including uh, the stuff that Peggy Fletcher Stack published, but they're more they're more uh, by the way things that I felt it was useful to bring to the attention of the reader, even though they went way beyond my 2010 cutoff. But I I really just you know as somebody. Said so after 2012, they had something that I thought they thought I'd be interested in, and I just gave them that that strong arm uh, denial of interest. And so uh, there are bits and pieces that go beyond that, but not much. So no no uh, deep throat source for this. Well, there such a source may exist, but I never wanted to contact anybody okay and and the that's another thing i did not want to have one single anonymous source as a citation and there isn't one single anonymous source everyone i spoke to uh, including people uh, like ellen blodgett who were at the center of church investments and church tithing and church income um when i was able to quote them they allowed me to quote them with, with their name, and I really did not want yeah. the the suspicion that readers of one ilk or another uh, have when you cite an uh, anonymous source. I just did not want to encourage that. And so, you know, if you don't like my sources, you can contact them because they're <laughs> cited. All right. So... Uh... So I think this is going to wrap up part one of this interview. We've been able to get a really good background for uh, Mike's, you know, kind of what it went into the research over the timeline, uh, what went into writing it, what his main sources were, um, and kind of the mechanics of how he went about writing the book. Uh, We need to swap out some batteries. And so what we'll do is we'll end this first segment. Um, Thank you all for joining us, those of you joining us through the audio and video as well. And then we'll come back with part two where we're going to actually dig into the content and the substance of the book and have a lot of fun. And then maybe in part three, we'll be talking about Mike's observations on the church today and his own life and talk about other things going on.